I've got a whole lot more questions, but Jeremy, I want to give you a second if you have a couple of questions for me. I just want to play with Felisa. Do you have some <laughs> games next time? I do. You know what? You actually have to use the discs to boot it up. This is like this this bad boy I got in 1985. This is this is my original lease. I can pop it open, everything like that. It takes discs. Um, I wrote discs for it. I wrote games for it. It's it's great for BBSing. <laughs> used to, it's I appreciate it. Connecting the CompuServe. You know, yeah. Prodigy. Prodigy. This is before the PPP flip trick thing. Yeah. Oh my God, Prodigy's after Lisa's time, and this 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 is Gould System Five, state of the art. Oh yeah, wow. <laughs> that, that would make a great years. that would make a great fish tank now. <laughs> no, no, you know what? It's been recommended. No, no, I still actually have the original glare screen on this. If I pop it open, there's a oh silk screen that covers it for a glare. Wow. Just in case, just in case, I have to revert back to the Lisa because my current Max. So, so I jumped. I, I, I was so pissed at Mac. I, I, I didn't switch back to him until uh, about 2000, 2001, 2002 because I was just pissed off at him because I bought the Lisa. It cost me 3200 bucks, and they discontinued it like a year later. Wow. It just – I was so freaking mad at him. I, I, after I graduated, I never bought another Mac until 2000. Um, I was so pissed. Anyways – but I still kept it. It's 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 it survived a lot of a lot of coding and programming and Sweet. I can't tell you how many hours I ran on that freaker. But well, uh, it saved me. It had spell check, which for guys with dyslexic, <laughs> it saved my ass beyond belief. And the funny thing is, out of my kids, my daughter's the dyslexic one. You think that the the, the boy would be the dyslexic one? So. Well, and, yeah. Anyways, so Brett, sorry uh, to digress. <laughs> Chris and I were talking a little bit earlier about the security implications being, I guess, forced upon the DevOps uh, folks now, right? Talk, talk a little bit about that, if you would. You know, um, some of my developer nerds, I, I used to be a programmer full time. I was since I was six, and I got paid for most of the time that I did development. But um, I'm at my heart a developer. There is so much change going for DevOps right now. And the reason why that is the case is because eventually, you know, you beat the dumb horse of security idiots. They eventually get the idea that, wait a minute, if I don't bake in security flaws when I'm making the source code, then I don't have to expend a great deal of money to try to defend against those flaws that I could have prevented in the first place if I had just done something. Um, uh, it, but then again, uh, you could call yourself, I don't know, Zoom and not give a crap about security when you build it. And you'd still be billionaires. I, I, uh, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I consider myself to be an understudy <laughs> of business stupidity, right? And um, there is this mantra of just ship it. Like, we'll get security in later. Let's get it out there get, and then get pregnant. And then we'll talk about uh, investing in condoms. So they, they are... Um, Zoom, to their credit, has tried to address some of the problems. Thankfully, they're going to try to do better with their crypto as well. Um, and But that is a classic example of, look, man, it's a competitive market. There are all these players. And I'm just, I just get it out the door, and then we'll fix all the security stuff later. And um, Zoom has now got organizations, large ones, that will not use it. And That's right. Oh my God! They're they're pretty much banned from the federal government, right? I mean, they, the government told me they won't do a meeting with uh, Microsoft Teams if you want Zoom versus that. Um, it's they, they they won't touch it, but they're still. I just read a whole thing. They're still going to make hand over fist money, best quarter ever. They're not going away. Um, That's because the consumer market has bought into it with this. Yeah, because you are. Consumer doesn't give a crap. The right time. They messaged at the exact right time. While WebEx was sleeping, and yep. there are all lots of yep. other solutions out there, they jumped ahead and went, whoa, 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 use us. And so because of that, and they were an, a voice in the wilderness, everybody was like, well, I got to work from home, and I got to do video conferencing. I guess I'm going to use that. So uh, let's have this very same conversation next year, and let's see if they're the juggernauts. All right, write that one in now. Put down the conversation <laughs> piece. And, yeah, so, I don't, so think, well, I don't well, think they will be doing as well next year as they are this year. All right, Jeremy. 
Oh, I just say, hey, we're, <clears throat> we're booked in. I've uh, locked you in on uh, Wednesday, there you June go. 3rd, 2021. Maybe it's a Tuesday. You tell me about it, I'm going to be like, what? Listen, <laughs> listen. at that time, they were going to go down the cyber range. And could we can see that, that crappy Arizona team that thinks they know how to play hockey play a game against L.A. or, <laughs> or, or Vegas. And we'll see those Coyotes do something besides, I don't know, nothing. Actually, uh, <laughs> unlike the Kings, the Coyotes made the, the new NHL playoff format for this year. So <laughs> – <laughs> They're doing better than we are. Contrary well, the to the Kings, they have a Vegas. Not, so. Yeah, contrary to their name, that this is in. <laughs> Sorry, Brett. Contrary to the name, what? Contrary they're... to their name, they're not kings of hockey. Well, twice. But they have the great which is how many more than Arizona has? Uh oh, <laughs> there we many... go. <laughs> that's that's what, one more than Washington. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah, is, but, but we have we've had better consistent. <laughs> and here I go. I couldn't even tell you if Texas has a hockey team. Yes, they do. The they do. They stole from Dallas Minnesota, Stars, which are a transplant. Exactly. Yeah, they're Minnesota. Which before. are a transplant? Weren't they the Nordiques, and then they became the Wild? Uh, no? Maybe. Maybe. How did maybe. they go? It's Minnesota all Stars, Stars, North Stars, Texas Stars. Everybody just buys a Canadian team, brings it down, and the poor Canadians have to create a new one. There you go. Um, <laughs> the best hockey players in the universe are from Canada. We all know that. We get it. They don't have to tell us anything. from Los Angeles. <laughs> so, so a, a final question I, I would have, Brett. Is, You're talking hockey, Al. That's, you better be a hockey uh, question. I, I know. I know. <laughs> uh, we, we hear a lot of pressure being put on MSSPs and MSPs from a security perspective, because their, their attack surface is so potential broad and, and distributed, right? Um, along with healthcare, by the way. You went yeah. back to the fruity beer? You went back to the fruity beer? One. That's all he had left. The other one's so, empty. Yeah. So from, from your perspective, <laughs> what, are, what are the top three things that, that you think that MSSPs are going to need to really be careful about as we continue on through the rest of this year? Well, first of all, uh, you're, if you're an MSSP, you are the number one target because as a bad guy, I pop you, I get all your customers for free. Um, I, you know, cybersecurity you know people are really bad at cybersecurity, which is, of course, hilarious, right? Um, you know, when I was doing uh, active pen testing, I would always look for the security appliance. I would literally suck up the network and be like, okay, where's the security appliance? And then I would only go after that because that's going to be the weakest defended system on the network. Uh, and so you pop that. And then what do you think, Jeremy? You I'm, I'm a printer guy. <laughs> you can call I always felt the printer is a security device. <laughs> it's great. You know what I love? I love open SNMP. <gasps> Let me get in. <laughs> well, I'm not, you know, it's, it's, it's always there on the edge. They just don't get it. All you have to do is one little ACL lock against SNMP from this interface but no they leave it broadcasting and don't change it from public or I'm private sorry. i'm sorry right? uh, you, you you just talked to start a conversation <laughs> about popping things there you go <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> let's go back to brett and finish those top three things yeah so mssps you are the target <laughs> and you have a fiduciary responsibility to protect the people that pay you money to watch and protect their networks so start taking your job seriously or Enjoy the lawsuit. I would have gone after the Microsoft Active Directory server. That's that's my hope. <laughs> that's usually buried pretty deep, though, right? So you've got to compromise ah. something first before you can get there. No, because yeah, admins, you can find admins hate remembering passwords. Those passwords are the easiest ones to break. Well, of course, you are. You pass the well, hash, right? So the uh, just looking for SMB Go. <laughs> uh, that way, you uh, all their patch systems are now vulnerable, and just whack that, and you're good to go. Yep. So. God's not staying up this late. Go on. <laughs> Packers, the movie. Packers, the movie, baby. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Poor Al. <laughs> but um, so take your darling job seriously or get out. Yep. And then second to that, uh, you know, the business is hiring you. Hopefully you're in tune with the fact that they're thinking you're doing more than what you're actually doing. And your salesperson didn't inform them. But I can tell you, our team is doing these things called instant response exercises. We have about four or five different offerings that we have. 
And one of the big outtakes that consistently shows up is when the MSSP is involved in these cyber incidents, they're like, well, wait, we don't do that. And then their answer is, well, what, you don't? Uh, because their entire policy book and all their expectations are that the MSSP is going to be able to do something they, they are literally contractually not allowed to do. And so uh, it, what that, about MDRs though, Brett? I mean, MDRs are beginning to respond now. Yeah. Well, th that's the warning, right? Like if you're an MSSP and you're not on top of this, that's literally the, the gun and the bullet that's going to shoot you dead. So you really, really right. got to step up here and get engaged do more than you're doing and i understand it's competitive market and a low margin and blah 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 but one of the ways that you can do that is you can incorporate things like threat intelligence because um mm -hmm. there has been a 300 percent increase in bad guy recruiting from the general world so after Always this call brett we want i want to know how much your threat intelligence costs because because <laughs> we we write back we love i'll put a plug in for webroot we love webroot I, I want to take a look at Mary. Don't I know you're going to be looking at this, Mary? Don't here to, to checkpoint. Um, Mary said web root. She's not going to have me when I talk about yeah. looking at checkpoint, but I wouldn't mind taking it here in checkpoint's point of view, right? No, but but threat, threat intelligence. L listen, we all agree. My techies look at it and they skip the MSSP part. The, the second piece here, threat intelligence. Signatures are dead. I hate to tell you people who anybody running a, an IDS or an IPS, I can't even think of an IPS right now outside of Fidelis that signatures are dead. There's just, it's just not out there. And that reputation is King right now and quality reputation. We just had a meeting with McAfee with Mo and you would think McAfee is thinking, Oh, we have all this marketing. We're cool. They're like, we, nobody will listen to us. There's so many people screaming on marketing right now. And it's so much bullshit that if you say something truthful, someone's going to say, well, my daddy, my daddy can do that 50 times. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a shouting match, right? They make crap up. Pee Wee Harmon is better off in this world. Well, right? so Pee Wee Harmon would be a marketing genius for security right now. In, in case All you right. don't know, Brett, uh, Jeremy is also working with the CTI League, which is a, a recent uh, – uh, set up, start up, I should say. Listen, intelligence is king. I think behavioral data to enhance it is very, very important. Um, but I agree with you, Brett. I, 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 and I don't, I think one of the issues is nobody is writing signature analysis anymore, period. They're too intimidated to release a product that has the word signature in it. Right. You know, I mean, again, the, the, the biggest we'll problem, call, they call it sensors now. now. Yeah, Sensors. there's just not enough talent. Like, again, uh, I really wish I could relay some of the stories. I'm in all these interesting rooms, and the people that everyone would expect would be good at cybersecurity, they have forgotten how to do basic security stuff. Like, it's we, we, we met the Adapt Ford guys down in South Carolina, they were excellent. But the problem is, the problem is, is that it's hard to get a crew like that together and keep them together. I don't want to tell poor Mike Jenks that's the issue, but that's true to keep them together because quite honestly, the customers that buy don't appreciate smart people. They think that they can just, that they can swap them out because there's another guy that says I can do the same thing. Oh, I, I sold my stock February 13th. I was, I was intelligent. I, I think it's changing to be honest with you. Like I'm starting to see industry pundits start talking about, the fact, like, look at this, this threat intelligence is this old. So my favorite story so far about threat intelligence platform is, do you remember the Melissa and I love you viruses back from the 80s? It doesn't. So a very high 90s. level threat intelligence platform just posted those as IOCs. So they're saying this is brand new stuff you got to watch out for. And that is quite literally crap from the 80s. That's because they're so desperate to produce <laughs> metrics, a number, that they publish stuff that is irrelevant. And so now many people are going, wait a minute, this is freaking Melissa virus. Like what? And as a direct result of that, it has caused many to go, wait a minute, that emperor it does not have any clothes on. And so that is a wonderful discussion because, again, I, uh, I am a capitalist like every other person, but 
when there are too many charlatans oh, in the tent. Capital is not a capital fan. Yeah, but go on. You, you, got, you <laughs> got to get rid of the charlatans. Otherwise, your business is lost. So, so It's hard to get rid of the charlatans. I have to tell you, Brett, I know you, we still have number three on your list to go, but the charlatans are a pain in the ass to get rid of because – they're so loud and so annoying. I, I and, well and funded, and well funded, well funded, right, Jerry? Well supported. They're, fucking, they're the New York Yankees of of, of baseball. For, <laughs> they're, they're of the cyber world. Except the New York Yankees actually produce something. So no, they uh, don't. They uh, buy uh, everybody uh, else's Yankees stuff and hope it works. Their, yeah, with their reputation. The the fact is is that um, the charlatans are a reality. They're going to be here, but I am telling you right now, I am seeing a significant shift. Uh, I mean, uh, the cyber warfare range was a huge victim of a charlatan, and that guy has lost literally everything, and he's out of everything, and that happened in a year. So the industry has already said to themselves, look, when we find these, these charlatans, we're going to punish them quickly and effectively, and they go. So I... I suspect that in our future years of news, you're going to see major players getting knocked out of the industry because of exactly what you're talking about. Whatever what happened to like, what was that lab company, Jeremy, down in Texas? Nefos Labs or so. What was that lab that there are very few independent labs out there, Brett? And there was one, and you don't see him anymore. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Not Aberdeen. No, no, no. It was, a, it was independent. It was like Nefos no. or something. It was a. Uh, I, my point is, is that Brett, it's it's hard to find because they're all paid for examinations now. Like if you go to Gartner and everybody else, I mean, it's how much money you give them that turns on if you're in the top right. I mean, I worked for a startup and they 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 move positions just because they gave money. Let's just be honest. Well, um, and and I can confirm, like that's not a conspiracy theory. That is as real as it gets. It's is the the, the deep fake. Theory. You know, you think deep fakes are real. I mean, we've lived with this for – we can go down every single one of them. I'm, I, I can't tell you. I just learned Fortune magazines a pay for play. I was like, what? But, but it is. I got an email that says you want to be in the top 500 sims. You know? Oh. Like, so let's circle okay. back. Now, what's your top third? Yeah, I was like, we can't talk about the – we can't talk I, about the I, scam. I'm not going to get distracted. <laughs> well, so I, I – uh, I was an uh, independent consultant uh, to a major news organization that's closed. Yes. And I oversaw the, the cybersecurity operations uh, and consulted to all of the things that they did in their online properties, which was quite a few. It's, it's the largest media company. So in doing so, I was actually positioned near the advertising department. And that helped me to truly understand all the stuff that's going on. Because when you look at advertising from the perspective of cybersecurity, you're literally talking about opposite ends of the world. Um, I, I'd written a paper for that organization saying that um, uh, malvertisements were going to become a major inroad. And uh, mm -hmm. I was quite literally laughed out of that group. They literally laughed as I walked out the door. And then five years later, I got a call from a VP and they're like, how the hell did you know? Like, how did, this is our biggest problem. It's rampant. It's a terrible problem. What do we do? And my answer at the time was, yeah, just get a big check and then send it my way and I'll come back in and help you guys. If not, then enjoy the fire. So the, uh, it's one of those things where the cybersecurity industry has been reluctant to get it, but, but take into account what's really going on. You're essentially asking a three-year-old child to invest in their future, right? Like they don't get it. They're not going to get it anytime soon because they have no idea what you're talking about. They just want to go play. And so that is when this, that's where the cybersecurity industry has been. And what I'm proud to say is, is that at this point through either sheer carnage or people who are like, oh man, there is this whole world that I had no idea was going on. Whichever one, and by the way, I have no preference. I mean, I kind of love the carnage. I love watching people die because they're stupid. Um, I get it makes That's me horror movies about before. <laughs> yeah, but but and it, can, it couldn't happen enough, right? But the thing is, is that there is a transition taking place, and in all of the heartbreak and negativity that's out there, there is opportunity. So as, as it's, it's every system is counterbalanced, 
we are way balanced towards stupidity. That means smart becomes a super premium product as the, as the scales shift back. And so I, it's a true, I love it because I, I love being in these times because of the fact that everyone eventually gets it. It may take them forever. You may cry a thousand times, but eventually they get it and eventually good things happen. So I really do think that we're making a change and I'm seeing the cultural catalytic elements that are out there to help make that change possible. And I'm from the standpoint of being the largest distributor of technology in the world, which is what tech data is, I'm able to observe that it is across the globe and in many profound ways being actioned in business, which means change is occurring. So, so Brent, I, I love my spot. I, I got to hold you on something because I know you, you hit a good point, but I got to hold you on one point. So we, you've, I've heard you say this a thousand times that, that there's not, not enough analysts out there. There's not enough smart people out there to, to review the data to do the work. If that's true, are there enough smart CISOs out there to lead these companies? And why is n nobody actually training CISOs to actually do their job? Because quite honestly, I think some of the worst things out there in the universe today are CISOs who are great bullshitters and couldn't do the job to save their life. And I know that you you have to kowtow to them and say, you know what, you're wonderful. Hey, you want to buy this product? But what, what I mean, what is it that a CEO, right? God bless a poor CEO who's gone through all this stuff right now. Right in our conversation, got to this point in this conversation. What is a CEO could do to make sure he knows he's hiring the right CISO to set up? Because that's more important than the freaking analysts. And all we do is spend a bitch about these analysts when we know half the CISOs in the world are lies. What do we do about that issue? Yeah, that's a, that's a particularly challenging problem because industry wide, the average job span of a CISO is about two years. So if your entire career is based on two year baby steps, like it's really hard to have long term planning or do anything intelligently. Right. Yeah. And so there is quite literally a simple mantra. You walk in, you decry the person is there as a total moron and taking us all in the wrong direction. You write copious memos of all the incredible amounts of money that you're never going to get to spend, but say that it's essential that you spend it. Otherwise, you won't be able to provide security. You wait for the bridge to occur. You get your butt fired and then wash, rinse, repeat. You go do the exact same thing at your next job. So that, I mean, that's literally like, that's exactly what goes on. So the thing is, is that um, until people are being held accountable. So I get asked by a lot of Congress people and other uh, political leaders, like, what can we do? And my general answer is you're too old. Stay the hell away from my internet. Right. But the, the, there is an opportunity, right, in that if we were to hold CEOs more accountable for their bad decisions, that changes everything very, very quickly. Because I promise you, if a CEO gets perp walked because their company got breached and people got hurt and Congress doesn't step in to protect them, I don't know, Experian, right, then you, if you were to perp walk the, the CEO of Experian and say, you you took people's data. They didn't have an opportunity to opt out. You lost their data. And now their lives are essentially significantly harmed because you're an idiot. Like if you put that guy in jail, the story gets out really fast. Hey, they're not kidding anymore. We got to do something. So I was never for the more draconian things, but I've, I've seen that only when people are forced to do something intelligent, will they do something intelligent. Now the question is, can we avoid Congress getting into the habit of dictating crap from on high that doesn't make any sense? Right. Right. So it's a really daunting challenge, and I definitely do not want to wade into that world. I really don't like politicians. Um, but the fact is, is that there are things that are out there that are helping culturally to make these shifts. But if you're a cybersecurity professional or a C-level person, and you believe that the world doesn't isn't coming for you in the dark with a knife, you're nuts. People are so sick of losing their data and getting harmed because of it. They're mad. And if you want to see the kind of unrest that we're seeing today in this world, um, let's have a few more big breaches and let's see what happens. Yeah. And I think especially on the medical front too, uh, in all fairness, uh, I, I have met a few and a few CISOs who really are good, right? So while, while we have a predominant 
scenario of CISOs who really are struggling with this two-year cycle of life, right, for, for a, a job, there are some who actually do good. And well, have, have you know, Brett, Brett, Brett and I are not saying that. There are some wonderful people in our organizations. The, 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 the cream has re really risen to the top. There are some guys who get the C-level stuff. There's no doubt about it. What The reason why I was kind of jarring Brett is because we always talk about the, the skill set shortage, but we never admit that at the management level, we have a bunch of idiots. And, right. and, 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 at the, and I'm talking easily 30, 40%. And I don't, don't mean, you know, I, the old lawyer joke, I don't mean to insult the 5% that are actually doing their job for the 95% of bad lawyers. But <laughs> the, the reality is, is that in the CISO world, I'll, I'll throw one name out because nobody ever listens to me anyways. It's Jeff Aslinger, who's a wonderful CISO. And he's over at iCare right now. And they're hard to find. And if I was another company, I'd call them up and say, listen, can I borrow him for 20 hours a week or 10 hours a week? I think that I'd better, I would better find a partner who's doing a really good job saying, can I borrow your CISO to get my organization straight? And I think that's the problem is, is that, that nobody really cares. That's cool. Don't worry, Jeremy. Nobody really cares to, to work at that level. They're so afraid. But the reality is, is there are some great CISOs out there. Yeah, there are. And, and, and I, would, I would still borrow beg for five hours and say it in 40 hours of crap. Yeah, agreed. And now, here's the other complication. And I'm not trying to nosedive us down another rabbit hole here. But there's been this misperception and the vaporware around cyber insurance, right? <laughs> and, and now you, you look at, at Trump, right, who put this executive order in place last year that gives, <laughs> gives the uh, companies, companies the ability to, to say, oh, this was an act of war. Therefore, because it was a nation state, and to your point, Brett, it's a primarily nation states, right? So we don't have to pay you. Keep paying us, and you think that you're balancing your risk scale, but you're not. We need well, a lawyer for this one. I, I, I actually, I love what he did. I love that he did that because cyber insurance was the excuse as to why I don't need to invest in cybersecurity. That's right. Yep. They're just yeah. like, let the breach come. I got insurance. I'll be fine. So uh, when the God King declared that to be not a thing, great things happen for cybersecurity because all of a sudden all these companies that were like trying to hand wave their security with an insurance policy got smacked. And that's awesome. That I hope continues to happen because again, if you're not going to take cybersecurity seriously in these times, you don't belong in business. You are no, irresponsible do and you are doing a disservice to the market and your customers. And I don't mind saying, bye bye to you because you don't belong here in this club so we absolutely have to embrace the realities of cybersecurity. stop the hand waving motion stop memeing this stuff and get yeah. down to actually doing your job yeah. and that can't be done alone but there are a lot of very passionate successful people and and by the way there are a lot of passionate unsuccessful people right and so we just need to find them empower them and they will transform our organizations so, you know, cyber warfare range, we take people who have, would never in a million years be allowed to do cybersecurity, and we inject them directly into the cybersecurity world. At Tech Data, I'm in the process. They're calling of, you, Al. They're calling you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in the process of making Tech Data the largest on-ramp of new cybersecurity talent into the cybersecurity world. And I think I can pull that off in about five years. That's so awesome. I have a couple. I think you can do it in two with Al. You bring Al over there. You can do it too. I can't tell you. We brought Al in. We're afraid of Al. We have our 9 a.m. call. We're afraid to put Al on a 9 a.m. call because he's crushing us. It's like, oh, man. We don't want well, to listen to Al. <laughs> Al. Al and I got to spend time together early on in my, in my career there at Tech Data. And it's guys like Al that, that put in the work and do a good job that are making a big difference for us all. And if only he was 25 years old, had that youth. Now. Yeah, so ask for a raise, by the way, right after the call. Um, but <laughs> and, and my, check, my check still hasn't arrived yet, just so you know. There you so, go. Um, but this is the time for us to find all the owls and all the female versions of owls 
and empower them. So another thing I'm doing in Tech Data is I have a huge initiative to try to bring in more female cybersecurity talent. And the reason why I'm doing uh, I'm that, that is not one. a benevolent I <laughs> I, I'm trying to open up cyber ranges in inner city Los Angeles and Compton and South Central. Again, I'm not a humanitarian, like to be honest with you. Like you should I'm be. Left, you should be. I'm and I'm not, my, listen, we, we are striving. We have this vacant hole. But to tell you the truth, like what is the percentile of graduates and what's the, the diversity there? I mean, this. Nobody wants to come here. It's only white rejects, like the four of us that are in our industry. Well, universities, gotta... universities are dead. So I, I'm going to let you know right now, in our lifetimes, we will see most universities gone. Even though they have all the money in the world, they are dead. They don't get it. They're never going to get it. Um, quoting uh, a city slicker. Right, we hit the head on this one. Cows can can something right now, right? <laughs> so the fact is, is that they are, they are a dinosaur that is waiting for the meteorite. So you have to look past them, but I'll give you an example. We have a partner, an educational partner, Pima Community College, which is considered the redheaded stepchild of Tucson, Arizona. Every, <laughs> every single one of their cyber teams, including total noobs, scored multiple times higher in a capture the flag event than the highest mentored team from a university. Wow. So I'm talking about people who prior to the exercise are like, oh, what tools should I use? What is this over? What's the objective here? Those kind of people had the basic constructs of their training to be able to quickly descend, orient, and excel. And they beat the tar out of every single university team, the mentored teams. That means a cybersecurity professional was on there advising the team. So. Yeah. Wow. And, that, that's a powerful story, and I, and I think, you know, Brett, given this, this whole work from home initiative with the, with the pandemic, which personally I don't think goes away until sometime next year myself, whenever we've got the tried and true, you know, uh, uh, protection. That's because you're, you're one of the old men. You're like in the 10 percentile of dying, Al. That's there, there. <laughs> but, but I'm having, sorry you didn't get into the category <laughs> conversation. Having said that, right? So, so stay inside, Al. Stay inside. <laughs> <laughs> you know, having said that, I believe that with the with the pandemic, it's it's driving just like healthcare, just like any other business, right? It's collapsing them at the moment. And I hope, to your point, Brett, that that this collapsing says, "Whoa, what are we doing wrong? What can we do better to give more highly skilled people out there to really make the difference in the we, world?" We need to have a meeting with Brett, and then we pull in like. Ellen Mitchell from Texas A&M or something. I'll tell you 100%, Brett, here's the issue. And I'm a Virginia Tech grad. I love, I love Virginia Tech. Yep. But it takes five years to get a stupid class approved by the government because they take government money. And so you can't change the classes to make them cutting edge. And to tell you the truth, nothing against half these professors. Dr. Arthur, I love them. And, but the problem is, is that they're not cutting edge. I mean, how many comp how many places teach Go and how many they never never mind latest security stuff. They don't even teach the latest programming languages. They get extra credit for learning Git. Jeremy, Git is extra credit. Oh my God. I can't and I'm I passed my Fortran class, thank you. Fortran seventy uh, seven? No, that was last week. <laughs> but my, my point is is that that I love what you said, Brett, even though I, I was listening to it, is that, you know, you have, if you train some people directly on the knowledge and put knowledge in their head, instead of all the crap we try to shove in people's heads in college. And I'm not, not saying college doesn't make a, a wonderful, well-rounded person, but if you expect college to put the, the necessary information to do a job in their head, maybe for the hardcore STEMs, but not in security. We teach them the CISSP. When you make a 13-year-old kid from India get a CISSP because he can read a book, you know that's a piece of crap. Well, they post the answers on the walls in the testing center, so they're mostly <laughs> doing a really good job of reading the walls. But uh, not to say that the CISSP is not a great degree. It's just that we- I'm sorry, Jimmy. Do you have one of those pieces of shit? I have zero certifications. I'm very proud of that, considering the fact that the U.S. government says there are 18 people on the planet that do what I do. You're supposed I to have, have a freaking CSSP to work for the government security. <laughs> Love it. 
so uh, I would have to say that uh, you've just hit on a book I'm writing. I'm actually finally writing a book, and I'm about to uh, to get to, to a point of completion and review and all that good stuff. And it talks wait, about- Wait, wait, Brett, Brett, the title of the book is I Taught, uh, uh, I taught Strippers How to Become an MSSP Superpower, or what? Like you just <laughs> given me a new mission for my life. I never realized that that could be the one and only thing I concentrate on. And thank you, thank you for that. That's all. I'm I mean, you were looking for women in security. I was, I was just throwing you a softball. He, all right. So he, so he invests one dollar at a time. <laughs> <laughs> the wrong <right>. way. <laughs> one style. Go play, guys. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> go ahead. You know, no one is uh, listening to so, this. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Thanks for, for like, careening me back at the point there. So, you know, males <laughs> and females are two parts of one mind, right? Like that's the reason why there's the paired soul concept in all of our culture. And women think differently about a problem. And as someone who has worked with uh, teams of both male and female at all skill levels, I absolutely am delighted to see the insight that women bring to cybersecurity problems and objectives. Mm -hmm. And because we don't have any females per se in cybersecurity, like we, this is one of the reasons why we're inhibited, right? Half cybersecurity of needs women. <laughs> half of our brain's missing. And, and they offer a significant advancement just out of the box. Like if you just simply said, train Bob, train uh, Nancy in the same skill set, hire Nancy because she's going to bring to you a diverse thinking to solve a problem. Uh, I, I think you're hitting a nail on the head. I think we all, listen, we dream of that day. I can't tell you how many days at DEF CON I'm like waiting for the women to show up, right? I well, mean, why would they? It's debauchery, right? <laughs> for and different it's reasons. It's full of memers anyway. Like, there's nobody in Japan that's actually serious about cyber. It's jokes they don't understand that. and smells they don't want to smell. But the hey, uh, by the way, uh, I'm about to ruin DEF CON. So here's what's going on, guys. Canceled. Canceled, yeah. and it's not a joke. If you look at FRAC and all the articles from the 80s and 90s, you can find that Oh, my a God. Yeah, how do you still have hair on your head? There's a pattern that shows that they are simply recycling frack articles for all of their new and upcoming topics and it's Bell, oh my god it's oh eerie. my god i haven't heard the word frack i can't even tell you i i had hair that was more down to here at the time this entire spot <laughs> you said here at one point oh my god frack magazine that, that's Holy right there. Uh, that, is nice. that 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 but keep in mind defcon is a national guard operation right so all those people are national guard people and they have don't tell priests that <laughs> but that's the thing like again that's a conference that could have become serious chose not to <laughs> right and and so again it's okay like if you don't know if you're a three-year-old operating in an adult world like a lot of the stuff's going to escape you i i mean i constantly use the. i, I love defcon the only issue i have with defcon is you can't get a seat for what you want to hear number one <laughs> and number two is is that it became, and I won't say the second who you know, right, to, to get into the speech. And so B-Sides took over. And what I love about B-Sides yeah. is that if you can stand through nine crappy speeches, you're going to get one really good one. And, and, and the thing is, I mean, we're grinders. We're hackers. Hackers grind. And, and, the, and to tell you the truth, I love the B-sides. I love Wild West Hack and Fest, whether it's on the East, you know, the West Coast in San Diego now. Or, but I, I'm a big, huge fan of the B-sides, right? Because why? Because they love this stuff. You know, I can't take RSA. I can't take Black Hat because the guy's getting on the stage to sell something, to make money, and to boost his ego. It's not there anymore. I miss – I really miss – I miss – Grandmaster Rat going up with a speaking spell, and and and, and just getting the crowd excited, right? I miss I miss Mudge and the old Mudge, you know, changing back office into pretty much a really good back office management. I mean, it's the the, the tech, the concept of tech and the love was amazing, and and like you said, like the biggest problem was diversity was we're geeks. We have – nobody wants to be us. I mean, I know that Revenge of the Nerds made us feel wanted 
in Galaxy Quest make us feel appreciated, but only we watch those movies, right? <laughs> well, I, I have four kids, right? And uh, nerds do pretty well these days. Uh, to me, it's a little weird, right? I always sort of, you know, I had to play jock so I could be a, a somewhat of a sport guy. Uh, but I was a nerd all along. I was, you know, head of the they, the football team had the hardest time with me because I was an academic decathlon and on the chess team, and I was doing football. And they're like, I don't get you. Like, I, I, what's going on here? So, um, yeah. But but back then, if you didn't, then uh, then you would not know what a female looks like close up. So um, they look like them bots, <laughs> but yeah. they speak better. <laughs> so the uh, but nerds do better these days, and a lot of. Uh, of families and things like that are saying, hey, it's the nerds that are going to be the most successful in life. But the diversity, I mean, I don't mean to go into this third or fourth hour of this conversation, but I mean, listen, right now in the United States, diversity is a huge issue, right? And, and getting people, I, I just, I'm at a loss. I mean, I, I, there's a couple of MSSPs I talked to, and you're having a hard, hard time finding people. And to your point, well, why don't you get guys in community colleges and gals in community colleges into your place, sponsor them, get them trained up, do a deal. Say they owe you X number of dollars if they leave, leave early. That's what you used to do at CSC. And, and send get them to the cyber warfare range for additional training. There you go. And my point is, is that, that this is a hurting community and, and, and for nerds to be so loved, and yet we're waiting for everybody else to show up. It's, it's not our fault. We're not manger. diverse. We have dogs in the manger, right? So the old university system, you know, it's a pay to play thing. They make you feel cool and but you have to pay for it. And so anytime anybody talks about workforce development or any of those other things, in come the charlatans in the universities. And they're like, oh, that's us because we train this many students and we're doing this and we're doing that. And uh, the thing is, is that they don't like, I got to tell you right now, anyone listening to this thing, if you talk to me about your college degree in cybersecurity, you've already lost most of me, right? Because I am not inspired by any university program that I have seen, and I've seen almost all of them. All of them come to me. And so that's the thing. Like universities are not it. But think about how profound it would be if they weren't the dog in the manger and they weren't sucking up all the money and all the mind share for how to get people into competency and jobs. Yeah. How much money do we have to now invest? Do you think, country? but That's but Fred, do you think that cybersecurity is really a vocational school? So that's it, okay. So I love that you use that term. So shame on you for that. Um, community colleges started off as being a vocational <laughs> school, but I'll tell I you. Was cool. I was thinking about the Germany structure of schools, but we'll go down to <laughs> community colleges. <laughs> so, or, so my, I, well, my ITT tech job. kind of thing. Well, my first daughter, my oldest daughter, just graduated cum laude from an, one of the highest academic schools in Arizona. She's starting school uh, at a community college. Which one is is, is it? The apricot? No, what's what's the one? It's the uh, Arizona, and it's college a vegetable. Prep. I'm sorry. ACP Arizona College Prep is one of the top schools. What's what's their symbol? What's their mascot? Thanks for putting me on the spot. Appreciate that, Sean. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Keep on going. It's the who cares. Uh, so, the, uh, I encouraged her to consider going to a community college, even though she has scholarships, scholarships for universities. Primarily because I don't want her to graduate with a house of debt, and that's her first obligation is to pay off a house, and she's 22 years old. That's, that's right. Thing. That's absolutely right. And so. The route that she's going, she'll pay for two years of community college, very affordable, and then she will take a scholarship for her last two years, probably at a university, if she if she continues to do so. Her job path, it probably will, will require it. It's one of the last few jobs that actually requires a college degree. Um, so she'll go through two years community, two years regular college for the, for the piece of paper, and then she'll start her career immediately and do very well. But... The, uh, that's someone who is cum laude, has every possible conceivable scholarship to all the great schools, all the other thing. And when she was faced with the choice of what do I do for my future, she was like, what am I, stupid? I can do this with almost no debt, and I can immediately move into a job. Why wouldn't I? So there are a lot of things that can be done differently. And so 
the fact that, that there is a dog in the manger, I literally consider my life to be, I believe, observing all of these titans fall, right? So I've, I've watched the, 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 the megalithic bells die. I've watched all of these major institutional, never going to change, da, da, da. They've all collapsed and been crushed. And as a direct result, I literally think I'm getting pretty good at seeing what's about to die. And I promise you, universities in the right. 70s, they were told, you're not making it. It's a problem. That was the 1970s. And they've go on, Jeremy, because I was going to go into your 20 for this conversation. Go on. I, I just want to say thank you for saying that so I don't have to say for college. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was gonna, <laughs> what I was going to say was kind of like not to say that everything comes back to the beginning. Cyber Range has classes, right? Yeah. So if I was to go to the MSSPs I know, and, and, and trust me, Andy's a great guy. And he's telling me how difficult it is to staff. I'm like, I've, I've got – Roberto, I did. I used to do construction. I, of course, left construction. Roberto never left construction. He, he owns a lawn mowing business. His son didn't know what he wanted to do. Now he does. He wants to go into computers. I'm like, I, I want to match him up with one of these MSSPs and just say, try to convince an MSSP, back them. Invest in them. Right? I mean, the, the, my point is, is that here's the cyber range. I saw you guys have classes. Could you put together a curriculum that says we can have a certified MSSP backed by tech data? So could, you, could you graduate a functional human for an MSSP? Yeah, could you put somebody right off the street into a seat at a SOC? Exactly. Yeah, what we'd like to see is we, 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 a couple of things. But primarily, we would like the company to identify the talent that they'd like to, to bring on board. And then send them over to us. We'll train them up and then hand them back as they train ready to go individual. So that's kind of the route that we're going early because that's an easy thing for them to do. They get to pick the personality and the cultural fit. We then simply upskill them to be able to do the job. Um, we're averaging for people about six months to get them from wherever they are, which is usually nowhere, to competent in cybersecurity. Ready to so how much does it cost me? So at the moment... <laughs> If you are doing it with the with the, the foundation, it's completely free, as in like, wow. you know, no anything, no cost at all. So at the Tech Data Cyber Range, um, we are a victim of our own success. So my contract from the foundation to Tech Data says any day that's not scheduled, we can hold public hours. I've had one public day. So uh, we're going to hopefully, well, I kind of, I lose for losing. But if we uh, have a little bit less demand on us, then we could probably start doing more public days as tech data cyber range. But the fact is, is that I have uh, three ranges in Arizona. I have four mobile ranges in Wisconsin. And anyone else that's listening to this call who's serious about cybersecurity, and I don't mean serious about making money in cybersecurity, but actually serious about cybersecurity, then you can work with the foundation. And uh, I would imagine that tech data will soon be able to deliver to you the technologies you would need to operate a cyber range and the foundation will be able to offer you the training that you need to operate a cyber range to be able to train up people. So we are about to be able to scale like we should have been able to scale from before. Um, the good news is we have all the right partners and our gene pool got enough chlorine injected into it to where we now have a lean, mean, clean uh, group of uh, folks that are mission driven to achieve what we need to, which is better skilled cyber professionals. That, but that's tech, data, tech data is connected to literally millions of businesses worldwide. So we have hundreds of thousands of partners, which are our customers, which represents millions of customers from them. So we are, we're the largest for a reason. And because there's such a desperate need for cybersecurity talent, we, the foundation and we tech data working together have the ability to quickly upscale people for low to no cost, um, I can tell you that when I talk to educational institutions, what I say is the right answer to me is the student learns for free, charge the companies whatever you want. And I don't know why a company would not have the easiest time stroking a check for a, someone's education in cybersecurity that's not necessarily a vocational education, but maybe a little bit broader than just cybersecurity. But then when they come out of that quickly, like not, you know, not more than two years, maybe working with a community college so they actually get college credit as well, then you now have a person that can be working 
and then when they graduate, are ready to go full on into the hardcore job. Yeah, I think there's a nonprofit here somewhere, Jeremy. We gotta figure it out. <laughs> I'm I'm hearing it. I'm absolutely well, I am. hearing it. I, am. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think three. If you want to save yourself the paperwork, um, <laughs> but the uh, yeah. So the foundation is five one c three. Tech Aid obviously is a corporation, but. Uh, ultimately, it's the combination of people that get it working together to the same goal. The, the calls that I'm having are storybook. I mean, I, I you know, institutional type entities, not necessarily government, but pseudo government, are saying, "Yeah, we're dead." Like, it, take a look at the ISACs, right? You have the MS ISAC and the FS ISAC. One of them is going to survive; the other one's going to die. Um, so what does ISAC stand for? Uh, I don't even know. It's a government acronym and it's stupid, but it's like information sharing, blah, 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 crap. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, but those were the biggest beasts in the field and they were arrogant and they were like, oh, it's a billion dollars to come work with us. And they're dead. They're on the ropes. And yeah. one of them's not going to make it and the other one might make it. We're, we'll see. But that's how profound and quickly things can change in cybersecurity, which again, I'm not afraid of that. I love that fact. I love the fact that if you don't get it in cybersecurity, there is a bullet that's waiting for you on that battlefield and you're going to, you're not going to make it. Yeah. Um, so like, again, this, there are so many great opportunities for people who are serious in cybersecurity. That's one of the reasons why I like your company, right? Like there are very few people that actually get it and are going to keep doing it. And I, I cannot tell you how deeply and profoundly I appreciate your frustration and what you must be going through on a day-to-day -day basis, offering jet engines in the era of the wagon, right? Yeah. <laughs> we have, we have, I've, I've got Jeremy, my favorite lose-lose. I mean, we, I, I lose money dealing with him. He loses money dealing with me. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, I'll tell you this. I mean, I don't want to say I'm old at the end of my career, right? I know, I know Al is, but I <laughs> <laughs> but I still well, have to be me Al here. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I, I really love my industry. I, I tell you the truth, I love everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and I was just on Ivory Wolf, who's actually black. But he's a great guy, uh, James Boyd. We're, we're, we're talking and trying to figure out how to get more people involved. This is the same conversation we're having where, you know, it's, it's a painful time in our lifetime. Whether, and I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican or whatever, right? It's painful because we all want the same thing, a better world. I mean, hands down. And, and, and this is the most painful thing is we love our industry. We want people in our industry and, Unfortunately, nobody wants to, to grind the pain, to tell you the truth, which, which is our industry. Our industry is not – listen, when you're, you're not hip-hopping and dancing and doing creative arts, this is hardcore science, right? And, and, and this really is – this is hardcore. I mean, it's hard. That the hard – it's not core. It's hard, right? And I'm having a hard time. Jeremy, you have a hard time. We have a hard time finding anybody, Right? And, and, and I'm not belittling Al. Al has been wonderful to us. I mean, he's like a diamond in the rough. He's like that Aladdin movie in, in, in Disney, right? I mean, who would have thought? <laughs> the 5,000-year-old genie. Yeah. <laughs> who, who, would have, who would have thought that the, a guy that thought the invention of the wheel was impressive could, could do what he's doing? I mean, it's, it's cr crazy, right? And yet... The guy, he survived the meteor. Yeah. 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 And, and he can tell you what the dinosaurs were like. He was there. He was there. He was, there. He was like, I can tell you what happened to the dinosaurs. I saw it personally. Yeah. That, but, um, let me tell you. Yeah. yeah awesome. And George Burns, I watched him bore. I watched him get bored. I, ha I helped a little bit. I got the towels. So, so anyways, I mean, I, sorry, Al. I didn't mean to drag you in on this. And Brett, I appreciate all you're doing. I would love to try to figure a way to make this all work, right? And Jeremy well, would too. I mean, we, the, the, the we are starving. Thing. Yeah, but the greatest, the greatest thing about cybersecurity is ultimately it is science. And so yeah. I, I frequently use the metaphor 
of launching a rocket into space. We just had a success from NASA and Elon Musk and all that good stuff. So every one of us could describe, probably in intricate and somewhat scientific detail, how to launch a rocket into space. None of us would actually be successful. Even though we know how to do it in our head, there's no way we would be successful in actually launching a rocket into space because it's science. And so because of that, it doesn't matter how many people show up in suits and do the tap dance and do the flashy lighting and buy the whatever thing that, you know, makes it cool. The fact is, is that in the end, you still got to get the rocket on the ground up into orbit. And because of that, you're going to see a tremendous amount of cataclysmic loss over and over and over again until the charlatans are finally weeded out. And what you're left with is people that know how to rock, rock, launch a rocket into space. But here's the greatest thing about it. No matter how much money you spend, look at the U.S. government. How much money have they blown, completely wasted, trying to get better at cybersecurity? But well, well, you know what, Brett, and, 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 and man, I, we could go on. We're going to divide this one in half. Yeah, uh, we're, we're uh, getting close to our time out here. Yeah, we could divide this one in half because this is getting warm, and we, that never happens. Um, <laughs> well, if you let me get another uh, beer, I'm out of beer. You know, get a refill. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you, you know what, you, Brett, you kind of hit the nail on the head and we're now 16 of this conversation is that the reason why charlatans get called out is because eventually they have to perform, right? Mm -hmm. Elon Musk, I don't care if what he calls his kid. Really, I don't care about the social stuff. First of all, kick-ass D&D player. You listen to his biography, he played D&D, right? Good. And he won an award for saying, I mean, you know that if he's playing D&D, he's a geek and he's one of us. And he plays Doom, like, uh, okay, anyways. So the point is, is that the charlatans, they only exist when the government pays you, regardless if you succeed or fail. Yeah. But when you have to own the result, you're no longer a charlatan. And, and unfortunately, okay. people, these VCers, these companies that are starting off the VC money, they pump, pump, pump money in to make it exist, Right. That's why we have the charlatans because we have companies that are, are getting money and they have too much money to lose that they keep on rolling the dice till they win. But unfortunately companies are buying into them too early. Right. Well, but the, they don't have an unlimited supply and people are getting tired of losing. Right. And so again, their, their time is coming. The end of them is coming. Well, so, but, but, but Brett, I mean, I won't interrupt you because, I can pull out some charlatans that are trying to redefine themselves. McAfee, we just met with Mo Cashman. McAfee is desperately trying to redefine themselves, and they've got great technology. They're trying to reestablish who they are, but everybody sees the old McAfee, the charlatan version of the old McAfee, right? And then you got Silence, who got a lot of money. Stu's not there anymore. Who's leading that ship, right? Well, there, there's a reason why the rats left that ship. Sorry, Jeremy. The, the, but it is. It's who's leading. It's like the, 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 this is. They're, they're, this, there's still things being at play, and unfortunately, it takes guys with beers to be honest about what's <laughs> happening right now. Right? That that we're not the owners of the fate here, but the reality is is that there's a lot of charlatans out there, Brett, and we expect tech data to help us square it away. We expect the cyber center to square it away. The cyber range. Well, and, and in, in our own way, we are doing that. And it's, it, it is a fairly significant impact in the market. So one of the first things that I did was I said, I sat the team down together and I said, as someone who's here, as long as I am here, if we make a decision to invest in a company that's a charlatan, I'm gone. I'm out, literally gone the minute that you do that. And, and then after you sponsored us, you, you weren't kicked out? <laughs> Not yet, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but the fact is, is that um, there was a lot of pressure to take the road that says, hey, look, they got all this money, they're driving sales, da, da, da. Uh, they were buying the business, right? And what I said to them is I said, I, we're not doing this. And the reason why we're not doing this is because I promise you, you're going to thank me. And it took only three months before I got a call from a senior executive saying, Oh man, you see what happened to these guys? Thank God we didn't invest in them. Thank when, wow, we missed. And I said, sir, that had nothing to do with luck. So I've worked with that company in the past. I know exactly who they are. I knew exactly what they were up to. And that the fact that they did not care about cybersecurity, they were memeing the cybersecurity. And it was only a matter of time before they got uncovered. And that's exactly what happened. 
So again, if that happens once or twice and people think it's luck, it happens over and over again and they go, okay, there's something here that I need to be paying attention to. That's right. And so, you know, we've done a very good, at Tech Data, we've done a very good job of keeping our offerings clean. Uh, and that what I mean by that is that we don't waste our time with Charlotte. And uh, again, uh, yeah. that is one of those things that's a hard thing to do in business to say, we're going to take a pass on your organization if we don't believe you're serious about something. Listen, the economy is changing, Brett, and the fact that you guys are still around and so relevant yeah. says a lot. 